question they've been bottling up. Well, I have a question. So, Chris, I, I mean, obviously, uh, in your slide deck, you changed it slightly based on what you heard during the day. Uh, you added some extra quotes for it. Did anybody else on the panel hear or see something from any of the presentations today that would have made you want to change your presentation and tell us something different? <laughs> <laughs> or enhance it, sorry. Right. Enhance yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> delivery. delivery. I certainly learned a lot from some of the other presentations. I don't know if it was pertaining necessarily to ours, but I was excited to learn a lot of new stuff. I guess, you know, we talked about BDD. It's like if I'd have known about the modern BDD, I might have mentioned it. <laughs> So one of the things, one of the reasons I like going to conferences is because we pick up a lot of different ideas. So when I was listening to the BDD talk, for example, um, Lisa had asked a question about story mapping. And it had been sitting in my head too. And, and I mean, what I do is I start to make connections and I start thinking about, oh, we could use story mapping for this and then um, Maybe we could use structured conversations from one thing, and maybe we could use event storming to do something different. And, and that's what I find out of listening to other people is, is how I can make connections. Um, so would it have changed ours? Probably not, just because of the nature of the talk versus something else. But it definitely, if I had had a different talk, um, might have changed that one, if that makes sense. I think in my presentation, at least on the automation part of it, I think I might end up referring to you know, some of Bob's points in the future for and I discuss some of the points for that, it's the mobile aspect of it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think that, I think, uh, I definitely do some editing on that side to, to at least tailor that but for mobile, or at least reduce some of the other ideas. From. So, um, Full disclosure, when I have a presentation to do, I'm basically in panic mode <laughs> right up until the presentation. So I was up in my room working. Um, and I'm looking forward to looking, watching all the presentations online. But just um, from some of the questions that I got and some of the what people said during the presentation, it will affect you know the next time I do it and what I include and what I don't. So it's really fun. And the interactive part is, is really important for me because it, I learned. Yeah, and it really meant what I said about, for me, giving a presentation is really a way to try out the concept that once I've thought about it for a while, it seems so perfectly clear in my head, it makes perfect sense <laughs> until you talk about it. Yes. So even though I talk about the same topics quite often, I never reuse presentations. I really wish I did, because it would save me a lot of time. But every time I talk about it, I get so much good feedback from the audience and the people I talk to that I incorporate in the next version. Um, and it makes it much more interesting for me too, because I do feel strongly about it every time I talk about it, because I've learned something new and I know I'm going to learn even more things. Well, it's nice to know that uh, not just the audience got something out of the conference. Absolutely. That's why, I, so like I said, it's why I speak at conferences, so I can come to conferences and learn stuff. <laughs> Next question. All right, Andrew, beat you to it. <laughs> oh, um, so yeah, so uh, Lisa and Janet, your presentation was all about should testers code, but let's flip that around. Should coders test? <laughs> but, but, but maybe, That's the easiest question oh, okay, ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a yes or no question. To what extent should coders be involved in the testing process? Because they have their jobs to deliver the product. That's my question. So I'm going to kind of turn it back. When, when um, Kristen was talking, we talked about what is quality. So the developer's job is to deliver what level of quality products, right? Because I don't think testing is any one person's job because you cannot test quality in. I can test all I want at the end. And if nobody ever fixes what we find, did I add any value, whatever value is, right? Probably not, unless it's to, hey, product owner, this is the risk that you've got. We're not fixing any of it, by the way, but, you know, so 
I think the developers have to take an active interest in what testing we do do. And of course, in my opinion, they own unit tests. I can work with them, but they own them. I'll let you add. Well, definitely, and, and test driven development is more about the design of the code than it is about yeah. testing. But I think that because most of us work on teams where we don't have enough testers, we have to get the programmers interested in doing testing. And I think when they see what we do, uh, the questions we ask, or the things we think of, or the, or the problems that we find, they, they are very interested in that and want to do it more. And um, I know, for example, uh, the programmers on our team, we kept finding browser issues because they do all their development in Chrome. And so, well, guess what? You turn it in Firefox or, God forbid, IE, and, and it doesn't work. And so they've labeled, we, they all work in pairs every day, and so they move around, they move pairs. And so they've labeled each workstation what browser it should use. None of them are IE, but anyway, <laughs> Firefox, Safari, or Chrome. And so they have to do all their development in the browser of whatever machine they're sitting at that day. And the browser problems went way down when they did that. So, uh, so, the, so they're kind of taking things from us of, oh, maybe we should be testing, or maybe we should be trying it ourselves on these other things. And, and as I had, think I had said, I've, we've, we've done, taught them some techniques of exploratory testing, how to use charters, and they, they enjoy jumping in on it. So, yeah, there's a there's a term I like to use, and I learned it from from Lisa is share the pain, <laughs> right? Sometimes you have to encourage them to help testing, so that they see what's wrong and why it's so painful, and then and then they really will step up. Right. In if, most cases, if you're having trouble getting your programmers to automate tests or to make tests automatable, build testability in, like Bob was saying. Um, this, I've done this on three different teams. When at the end of the iteration, the last two days of the iteration, we're getting ready to release, we need to do manual regression tests because that's all we have. Everybody on that team does manual regression testing. So we take this manual, the scripts, we divide them up amongst the team and programmers, DBAs, scrum master, whoever, they all do automation. And you would be amazed at how fast automation begins after you start doing that. They'll do manual <laughs> testing and then, yeah. Right, and they have to do the manual work and then they go, oh, this is really awful. Uh, and the same thing on the team I'm on now. We have, they have a ton of regression tests, but we still have a long list of manual regression checks that we had to do. And so, and it took a long time every time we had to release. So the developer pair would start helping us with that. They're, and so they're like, oh, let's go through our integration test. I think that we may be able to cover some of these manual tests and, and do them with automation. So it's a great motivator. Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, I mentioned I worked on a fish farm in British Columbia, and I, I learned the nature of the expression, you're in the same boat. <laughs> because if you're in the same boat, you're doing the same kind of work. If it's not fun, then that's what you have to do. It doesn't really matter. You're not gonna sit back and fold your arms. No one's gonna put up with that. So having developers be part of that, um, I think, teaches them to understand, they, they learn about what that means to test that way, manually. And, and I think what they've said is absolutely right. They start figuring out ways to make automation easier because they don't want to spend a lot of time doing manual testing. Um, and I think it also will change the way that they write code and, and deliver code. Because you'll probably stop hearing things like, it works on my machine. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting about the boat. Jeff Patton has a metaphor he uses of, you know, we're all in the same boat and there's a hole in the boat. So everybody said better start doing something about it. I like that. Yeah. But like, uh, like Janet said this morning, and this is a quote, one of my favorite, many of my favorite quotes are from Elizabeth Henderson. Of, you know, testing isn't a phase, it's an activity. And it's an integrated part of development along with coding. There's just two different activities that are part of coding. There's a lot of other things that are, that are part of development. And there are lots of things that go in development, and testing is just one of those things. For, uh, for us, we had uh, obviously the same problems of leaving testing to, till the end. So, like on my session, I said we moved all of the automation to the front if we can. We started by writing the tests just as manual steps and committing that to that feature branch as the first commit to actually getting something done. 
Um, and then you're moving into actually committing automated tests that fail, uh, even if they're just BDD tests that are a very sunny kind of uh, test that doesn't have any of the cases. But at least you know when you're done to some extent, and you can iterate on that at other tests, but you're continually doing uh, things uh, for testing before you do the implementation. I think that discipline allows you to get rid of that QA bump where everyone has to be on deck and smooth it out because we certainly want to be at a place where we're always deployable. We want that red button for the CEO to say, hey, was this feature done? All of a sudden, super important. If that answer is yes, they hit that button and they got the release. So part of what we try to do is to make sure that we're always releasable. Um, we don't have a website that we continually push to. We have a product, which means we can't continually give updates to customers. It would drive them crazy. So four updates a year, um, and that's all the change they can handle. So we have to work around that. But internally, we definitely want to be always deployable artifacts, and that includes having all of the testing in there as you code each feature, each story, whatever you have. Um, so that's been a great way to get rid of that pain. Prior, uh, prior to the last couple of releases, that was definitely the pain. Uh, we're past most of that problem. And nothing's 100%. There'll always be spikes oh, of new functionality. Then you know, the CEO says, Why, uh, wow, that's a great spike that, that you showed in the demo. You know that big conference is coming up next month? <laughs> yep. Wouldn't yeah, it yeah. help sales? We had that in there. Well, guess never, what show, never show spikes in a demo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, we're still learning some things, but uh, we're in a very different marketplace. So anyway, uh, you do what you can. You start yeah. to put that process in there and you smooth up. That, that QA has to get done no matter what. It better not be left as a giant lump just before that release date. You try and smooth it out as best as you can. Um, I think one of the, the best uh, projects that I've worked in the recently it was so successful. It, it was not just because you know, they were the right way or the right devs, because um, the QA and the devs, so the dev that I had with me, was able to work with me at a similar level. So um, the dev was not just thinking about, I need to code it the way that the spec says, or the way they're asking me to do it, the, the document says. But it was also thinking about, is this doing the right thing? Am, am I, am, is the product actually gonna do the right thing? So he was thinking more as a user point of view. He was coding and looking at that description. So he, he had a, a QA mind to him uh, at that time, whether he was actually, he had done testing before or not. I'm not sure, I'm guessing he did, and that's how he came up with that. Um, but that's, uh, I haven't really worked with many of, of them. And, and it's not just when they write their own code, but there's also, um, when they co-review other people's code, but they don't just look at the code and say, yeah, that kind of makes sense when I read through it, uh, but actually take the time and then uh, run it and go through it and think of at least more than just to do what it's supposed to do. Um, so yeah, it is beneficial if they know, uh, if, if they have done some testing, because it, it helps to be very developers as well. Any final words? Laura, please have the next one. I think Janet or Lisa this morning was talking about early scrum teams and Ron Jeffries kind of making a comment about what is the tester going to do. So my question is how did you overcome that and any advice for people like joining scrum teams not necessarily as a developer but as an undefined role and how to add value? Well I know my answer back to JR was I really don't know Let's figure it out together. And, and I really truly meant that because we were beginning. And then that's when I went and found Lisa. <laughs> and um, at that time she was writing a book, so I was sitting there practicing everything that she was saying and kind of giving her feedback saying, that's not working. Um, and, and having those kinds of conversations. Um, so I think a lot of times it's walking in with a really open mind and really thinking about what it is, what value do I think I bring to the team, and then seeing how we can uh, fit in. So there is no nice, clear roles that says, you are a tester, you do this. Well, I could say that, actually. But you know, it, it will shift in every team, depending on, on so many things. Yeah, at the, at the time, I had that conversation with Ron. 
there were no, this was extreme programming, and there were no publications about it that said what testers should do. They didn't even mention testers. Yeah. It was the customer, the programmer, and the product owner. Or wasn't the product owner? No, I think that yeah, was just that's customers the and programmer. Yeah. That was it. And so, but I was on a team with, with eight developers, and they were people I'd worked with before, and they thought they needed me. Uh, and we just were experimenting and talking to people like Jan and other people that we found via the extreme partly mailing list and, and what are the testers doing and hardly, there were hardly any testers. I, the first XP conference I went to in 2001, there were very few testers. The second one, Janet was there. Um, and and you know, Kent Beck one time said at a, at a conference keynote he was give, giving, that it's like, yeah, that Lisa Christmas, she just elbowed her way on in. We didn't think we needed testers. Um, <laughs> but it was just experimenting and like, what can we do? And, and talking to people, I, I had a, had conversations with, with some of the pioneers of Agile, like Bob Martin and Warren Cunningham, and they were like, okay, well, here's what we're doing. And then I noticed that a lot of teams didn't have testers, and so they were coping with it. They were trying to cope with it by building test frameworks so they could do these, uh, BDD style tests or acceptance tests from development because they were trying to fill that void. And I think they were happy to get people with more testing expertise onto their teams. Um, and so interestingly enough, this book that I wrote back in 2000, 2001, Ron Jeffries actually helped us put that book. So I think he turned his thinking around pretty fast. Yeah. So he, he gave us a praise quote for the second well, book. Well, yeah, on the second book he gave us a praise quote. So yeah, yeah. yeah he totally got on board. I think at the beginning of XP, there's a, definitely an attitude of testers are absolutely not needed. If you're writing high quality code, you don't need testers. Definitely was. Absolutely. But nobody was really thinking about things like security testing and usability testing and the know, attributes, the quality attributes. All these other, yeah, all these yeah, other non, aspects. Non-functional requirements. Exactly. Right. Well, when people say they don't need testing or don't need testers, the question is, of course, what do you mean by testing? What do you mean by testing? You mean checking off the box at the end of the project? No, you probably don't need that. So we already talked about how value means different things. It's hard to say how you add value, but talking to people and just observing too. Where are there obvious gaps? Where do you think someone could do something different? Maybe you're not that person for everything, but maybe you can be a catalyst for finding the person that can do it or changing somebody else's role so they fill that gap and you can sort of backfill them. So it's talking and observation I think is really important. I think also um, during the XP days of early Agile, the focus was so much on functionality mm -hmm. that it totally um, eclipsed any other types of testing which are equally important. Yeah, and a lot of that probably goes back to the first big XP project was the C3 project at Chrysler that was a financial type of application and there really wasn't much beyond functional testing for that particular project and they drew all these conclusions. I think it was a bit naive. But, uh, but and I've also met delivery teams that didn't have testers that the, the programmers were quite capable and they, they had those skills already. They didn't need to hire specialized testers. Everybody's were every those team projects different. successful? Were they successful? Absolutely. I know I know some teams that are very few, but I know some teams that are successful without testers. It depends how f how your organization is structured, whether you're uh, filling positions or whether you are seeing if there's enough people that can fulfill some roles. I have a relevant question. Why do people not believe in manual tests? Depends what you mean by manual testing. Yeah. Like exploratory, creative testing. Everybody believe. I think everybody ah, believes in that. No, I let hope me finish everybody. my question. Okay. Uh, <laughs> in the industry, uh, people consider that you are a valuable tester if you do automation and you know two or three programming languages. You are considered a highly valuable person and you may earn some money. If you are doing some creative testing, manual testing, know how to apply the best methodologies, you're not considered like a valuable person. So why do people not uh, believe in manual creative testing? And what do you personally do to change this opinion? Well, obviously the talks like Janet and I gave this morning are trying to fight that, but Personally, I believe it's because most, even development managers, they don't know what testers do. They don't understand testing. They do understand programming, and so test automation seems valuable to them. 
and a lot of vendors over the years have sold test automation as the silver bullet. And they don't understand exploratory testing. They don't understand other forms of manual testing. And they don't understand the questions that testers ask that really help everybody on the team. And so it's an easy out. It's just like certifications. People want a certified tester because, well, that must mean they know how to test. Well, I don't know of any multiple choice exam that could tell me about your critical thinking skills or your problem solving ability. So, or your mindset and attitude, which to me are the most important aspects of a tester, your curiosity. No, I think it's just ignorance and an easy way out and nobody can criticize you for doing what everybody else is doing, so it makes it really hard to change. I think we had that discussion at the last panel at the Agile Vancouver with Scott Bellware. I wasn't present, sorry. Yeah, well, let me remind you of one thing that was said and that there is what's called partial automated testing and that testing can be done in a manual way with the help of certain steps automated. Um, so the whole uh, idea of agility can be applied to the testing uh, work even if it's exploratory. Um, those are very valuable things. But going back to your point as how we've been oversold a whole bunch of tools around Agile over the last 10 years, certainly are in a predicament where, um, yeah, this is BDD, given when then, and it, I shudder when I see these things. That's why I wanted to do give my talk. Um, you need to have, uh, you know, you have to step out of this dogmatic way of dealing with Agile. I think I also need to talk about what do you mean by automated testing? Is it just running scripts in a tool, or is it a little shell script that creates just data? Just imagine, you are, work, you are looking for the job here in Vancouver where the industry is so competitive, and your resume, if it doesn't have the big stack of technologies, wouldn't be considered at all. So what I think is important is when you talk about automated testing, that there's more value also to automated testing than just a script. To, to write unit tests, and it's considered mm. like testing. You are asked to review the code and do integration testing instead of reviewing the requirements pros or do the uh, security tests, which is critical. We have seen a lot of uh, unstable and horrible, from the point of usability, applications produced here in Canada. That's, the, that's unfortunately the total, but that's not the rule. Like, for example, my company is not like that. that it's a rule. I'm asking, but what do you do to change the beliefs no, in the you no, find You purpose. find a place that, and support a place that does it the right way, that appreciates you. You, do, you, get, you have you get the law of two feet. You can walk away and not apply to those. And that's their fault. They'll continue to make the mistakes by uh, thinking that. But it's mainstream. That's, right? that's okay. So, that's okay. So Agile was the outlier before. And now it's the mainstream. It's the same thing. And as a tester, you can go to developer conferences and talk about this is why testing is really useful and this is how I we can help the projects. And that's what I try to do and that's why I speak a lot, is to try to again. There's also a lot of meetups that you know it's, you, you, right in your town, like you can go, there's a testing meetup here, why there's a you developer. Are, why are you testing? Yeah. yeah. But you know, you go to the there's a polyglot. And I'm asking about your personal approach. What do you do in the industry to change the beliefs of the recruiters or the managers? Persuade that we are valuable people if we even don't. You try, try from the tests. community. You can't just go and tell a company to do something differently I or whatnot. So what I did for Git, for example, because no one would use Git, especially in the Windows world, is I went to all of the meetups and I talked about it and I showed why it's important that we <coughs> adopt it. Um, and uh, that involved a lot of um, online Twitter, online forums, you know, a lot of debates, heated debates, but you stick with it and people will all of a sudden join you and say, wait a minute, logically you're right, and you will start to gather, the snowball will grow. But when you interview someone, do you consider people only with the strong technical skills only, or do you ask for the creativity and some methodologies behind critical thinking? Of course. Thinking. Yeah, I don't want a certified tester. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're getting here into a, a different HR yeah. venue. But you asked what do we do to change it. It's hard to change people. One of the things I found useful you are very in, influential, believe me. One, one of the things I found useful both within an organization and from a community perspective, are using the patterns in Linda Rising and Mary Lynn Mann's books, Fearless Change and More Fearless Change. Trying these different patterns gives me a good structure for here's a way I could really get change. Uh, you know, for example, if I'm having trouble making the managers in my company understand the concept of technical debt, I can try to 
arrange a conversation with the with the CFO and say, hey, could I could I have ten minutes of your time? I want to explain to you what it's costing the company in dollars because we have all of these un, all this unmaintainable code, or we haven't been able to spend enough time doing exploratory testing, or whatever it is. And I and I couldn't translate that into dollars and cents. That makes an impact on that person. So. Finding patterns that apply, finding influential people that you can talk to. I've found some success. It doesn't always work. It's very hard to fight organizational culture, but it's worth, we have to keep trying to educate at the executive level, especially for people to understand why is it important to make an investment in quality? Most companies have no idea. They just want to go fast. And people, they think agile means go fast. So they go <laughs> agile. <laughs> agile is about making a huge investment in quality and it takes a long time and it takes a team years and a lot of time to get good at it. In my experience, it takes years. And so uh, there has to be a lot of education of the long term. And of course, our economy works against that. The stock market, in the US at least, rewards companies for short term results. So they don't care about making an investment. So um, I was at a talk, I think it was five year testing a couple of weeks ago with Michael Bolton. Yeah. Um, and one of the things he said is that testers, like, we are usually seen as second tier citizens, but um, it's only when we actually build our reputation that we get some recognition from people, whether it's in a company or in the industry. Um, so what I have seen is that there are many testers that, that do the you know, follow the script instead of testing, and that's what people see. And there are only a few that get noticed because of their uh, ability to do more exploratory testing. And so those people are the ones that the companies will hold on to. Uh, but then don't, they don't want to spend the time and the effort to really find all the people that's like them. And it's not just about finding the people, but how do you assess that in an interview? It's really hard. And, and it's not just hard to find the process of, to assess it, but is the person that is looking for a job willing to go through, say, a week-long process of assessment to see if they fit and they're actually right. So um, it's not an easy thing to do, just like building a reputation is not an easy thing to do. It takes time. So once you get put on the door, um, now you've got to show that you can actually do it. Um, if we actually get enough people that can provide that example to managers, then maybe they will see that, yes, if we put the effort into it, we can find those people. Um, but I think there are still a lot more people that, not just from the manager side, testing side think that testing is let's just follow this script and it's written and let's just do it. There aren't that many people yet that are still recognizing that there is more to it. The other problem is is that other um, when testers become really good, um, all other skills come to come into the fold and they end up actually being recruited to just be another dev or to be promoted to be a dev. Except except so. for the fact that I know a whole lot of people, testers, who were devs, who were programmers, yeah, yeah. and have seen the light <laughs> <laughs> and become testers because testing is so much more fun than programming. Yeah. I don't think it's their fault. I'm saying is that yeah. traditional management, they see that as because of the pay, because of that, I've seen that over and over that uh, you sort of uh, I graduate to actually a developer after you've been a test. One of the things I've noticed, and I see it more and more, but it's sporadic. If, if an organization um, sees value in a good tester, that tester gets paid as much or more than the programmers. And, and I've seen that happen because they want to keep them and they see the value. But I think the testers also have to learn to articulate the value that they add. What is it I'm doing? Making things visible. Most of the time I walk into an organization and I'll ask the programmer and I'll say, so, you know, how's your tester doing? Or, you know, what, do you, what is your tester doing? And they'll go, I really don't know. So I think testers have to learn how to make visible what they do. Um, when they're doing stories and adding tasks, articulate the tasks. The worst thing that I see happen is test this story. <laughs> what does that mean, right? Have three or four or five tasks ac accordingly because we do different things. You know, we have to create the test data or get the test data or whatever has to be done. 
make it visible. And I think that's one of the, the best things that people can do for their craft is is show what it is. I mean, if you wanna if you want to actually continue with testing, it's really important to go to organizations that are mature, that actually do treat a team as a team. You don't have a dev department, you don't have a testing department. That is that is one of the biggest ways to kill your career is to go in a place that has a brick wall between development and, and QA, but it still happens. It happens yes. in very, very technical companies that uh, kind of made my eyes uh, open quite wide when I saw who was actually still doing this kind of stuff. Um, and But they easily and quickly are shown where the faults are and they reorganize quickly to divide up uh, the teams in a more uh, cohesive manner where they're all working together and, you know, for example, for me, I make sure that the testers are working to get the requirements in and they're the first artifacts that get produced. So one of the interesting things is, it's easy to see when you have the QA team over here and the dev team over here, but a lot of times you'll go in and they have, yeah, we have a, a, a co-located team, we're all sitting together, but that's the QA team and this is the dev team. <laughs> right, there's two sitting together, but those are the QA folks, we test then, you know, or we code then test. It's still the mentality, if you call, whether you're sitting with the programmers or not, if you call them the QA yeah. team, they are the QA team. And, and, this, and the, the mesh doesn't ever happen. A quick, big, big red flag is if those guys are not in the same stand-up. Yeah, huge, <laughs> huge. Uh, but I mean, the, I've had that experience of going into a new company, they never had a tester before, or, oh, we're doing agile, extreme programming, whatever. And now, while well, you're a tester, where you can't come to the stand-up, you can't come to the planning meetings, and you know you can't change everything about a new job. You got to pick your battles. And so this particular job, I was like, okay, and I just let them go. And when they meet, miss the first release date, I went to the the coach. It was XP team, so they had a coach. I was the coach, and I said, okay, well, you did it your way, and you missed the release date. How about we try it my way? For the next release, just for the next release, and if it doesn't work, we'll go back to the old way. Let, let me come to the stand-ups. Uh, let me come to the planning meetings. Let's estimate testing along with development. And we made the next release date, so they never look back. But sometimes it's just proposing experiments. Um, another good way to make quality, I guess, more visible, and, and it's just to ask for feedback. Go to your stakeholders. Go to your customers, and say. Oh, could you give us some feedback on that last release we did, or, or you know these features that we put in production? What did you think? How did that help you, or not help you? And just in the process of thinking about it, all of a sudden they realized, hey, that delivery team—they really did some good stuff for us, and it was really important to us that it didn't have bugs in it, and it really helped our customers. So a lot of times you can just get them thinking about it by asking them for feedback, and the feedback is useful for you too. One point about um, in including yourself in the stand-ups. Um, they will say, wait a second, the stand-ups now got 10 people. Yeah, There's yeah. too many. So it does kind of sometimes bubble up saying that, and, and kind of beg the question, is the divide, if, is the proper divide in the organization there to make sure that you have small enough stand-ups, so you have pizza-sized teams working that should include the testers? Um, I do think that there is a, a distinction that needs to be made between testers that can actually participate in the stand-up tester that maybe need more encouragement into it. Like we're sitting in front of the group right here, but to some extent it comes to the, I mean, if that role exists, the QA leader, the QA manager, to really draw you know, people into this and to participate and to help them to, to, to see that their voice is important and that actually has something to say. But there are many testers that when you actually talk to them one to one, they are they have very good things to say. Their, their thought process is, is really impressive, but when it comes time to saying something that stand up, it's like, they don't feel comfortable saying it, they don't feel like they, they have the right words, so it's really up to the, whoever is responsible for that to, to be able to bring that up from people. Yeah, they need to feel safe. Everybody it's needs to feel safe. Safety is a big thing. Sounds like there's a lesson for scrum masters. Oh, there's a big lesson for scrum masters. <laughs> it is a big thing, but people understand that. Or the rest, of the, of the, the rest of the team, right? We're supposed to be self-organizing, so. So, yeah, can I ask somebody else? Yeah. So, one thing that we do with testers as well is that they're the only ones that can actually merge to master to release. Ah. It's not a dev thing. So, forget it. If you, uh, 
if you want to trust your testers, then you give them a key part of the workflow. And so we're done with it. There's no more arguments. Interesting. Next question. Yes, sir. You mentioned uh, that in the early extreme program, they, programming, there was a tendency to focus on functionality. To focus on functionality. Just on, oh, just on functionality. No, the actual, well, there used to be. I'm not saying that. But, 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 but in action, is your experience of Agile that there is still, I mean, I'm not very experienced with it, but it seems to me a fundamental flaw in, in that you're going to forget a whole bunch of stuff. Because if you focus on stories and acceptance criteria, how likely are you to write an acceptance criteria that this must not crash when the server doesn't have this file in this certain, you're not going to write that kind of stuff. So, to me, there's always been this, this like a bunch of tests which make your app robust yeah, and, and useful that Agile kind of doesn't think about. Is no, that don't, so, so don't say Agile doesn't think about it. It's up to the team to think about it. And, and that's one of the ways the testers, because they're thinking about those things, can add um, a lot of, you, you know, just making people aware. What about this? And start asking the questions. Do we need to be concerned about that? Because the last release went out and, right? And so it's the teams. It's not about Agile not concentrating on it. It's about the team forgetting about those things, right? There's nothing in Agile that says, thou shalt not think about that stuff, <laughs> right? It, so that's not a specific Agile thing. It's just that we get concentrating on the small stories and we forget the bigger picture. And so, we need to figure out a, a way to think about the different levels of precision, the different, um, from a system feature story level, we have to think about the different ways of the non-functional tests, if we want to call them that. There's so much more than let's make sure that story works, because that's a really big problem I see. Yeah, the, the, and I think the reason that that started out that way in XP was, oh, the customers will write all the acceptance tests and then the programmers will automate them. And the idea that a business stakeholder would think of, well, I wonder how many people should be able to be on this application at the same time. And what, they just assume that the developers know, oh yeah, we need, it. we need X number of seconds of response time, it can't be slower than that, and of course, we need these different levels of security for different types of users, and they just assume you know all that. And I think one of the things that transformed that for the Agile world was Brian Merrick's Agile Testing Quadrants, where he yeah. got us all thinking about these other aspects of testing, and Janet and I took that and ran with it because it worked really well. It's like when you're in a planning meeting talking about a, a story or a new theme or capability, and mentally run through the quadrants and start thinking about all the types of tests you'll need to do, and you start bringing up those issues, and people are like, oh, yes, you know what, we should first do an architecture spike and do some performance testing and make sure it scales. Or, uh, you know, we need to, maybe we need to get a security audit because we don't feel like we have the expertise and we're worried about security. So just bringing up those issues is important. And I kind of one question, which was like, did, did you have a, is there a good methodology for doing that? Is that, is that the one you found? Oh, I like my methodology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, my presentation was on the uh, touched on event storming right. and yeah. focusing, yeah, that's a great way to focusing on activities that bring testers and developers, DevOps and product owners together to have those discussions, right? And you will have those interesting talks on the wall as to why is this workflow the, the way it is? And the DevOps guy can say, is that two seconds that between these two events or is that allowed to be two minutes? Because if it's allowed to be two minutes, I can cut out about you know a month worth of work here, and we can focus <laughs> on some of these other things. But you don't get those discussions if you do things like uh, you know the prescribed way. First, you get the requirements, you pass them on, you have a design session that only the architects deal with, and move it on. So you think you you, you cover you will cover all of the non-functional? Yeah, it's just one of many tools to many. get yes. to get people in the same room uh, <coughs> to talk about what you're building uh, because. Uh, you know, there's a lot of gray areas and uh, non, really non-defined boundaries between certain things in software. It's a very soft art, not really a science. So you need to be uh, at a place where you have a very clear vision and direction. And to set that, you need the input and arguments with everyone to, so that people know why we're going this way. And I think when the collaboration is lacking, uh, then you don't have that. You have assumptions about which direction things are going. And 
the collaboration. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe but there's lots of different ways. In general, it's easier to get stuck on functionality, right? Because that's a concrete thing you're building. That's a tangible product. Yeah. So that's not unique to Agile. And exactly. one of the best questions to ask, because I do think it's about asking questions, is just, what are you worried about that you can ask anyone? What are you scared of? If we release tomorrow, what's going to keep you awake at night, right? So I don't think that's, I can see that Agile originally was more focused on functionality, especially with XP. But I think you can end up with the same problems as easily in Waterfall or any other methodology. Yeah, I think the, the approach of getting other stakeholders involved and getting their, their opinions is invaluable because client services is going to have different concerns, support's going to have different concerns, and getting them in the same room together is going to shed some light on some issues that you may be overlooking. Uh, uh, Adam, I just wanted to uh, express appreciation for what you just said um, about, uh, hey, is software, we, we, sometimes it's confusing because we talk about software engineering and logic and, and uh, you know, the science of computer science, but you know, not really, it is art. Well, what about a garden? Biology science, right? Plants grow, <laughs> but there's so much to gardening and how you tend yeah. to it that makes it entirely an ugly mess or, or a beautiful garden. Yeah, and it really is, uh, you know, when software comes about, you know, it's uh, organic and it's writing. Software is written, and uh, you know, and that's why. Uh, that's why we're here, you know, because it's it, it co complicated and you have to yeah. try a different approach. I mean, if you're building bridges and they're toy bridges and you get a, tons of balsa wood to work with, you can quickly tear stuff off and put stuff on. Um, but when you're building a real bridge, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's that ease at which we can rewrite software and refactor and all that that gives business the idea that, hey, this stuff's easy, just do it this way, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> Not, we're not, we don't need to you know, uh, compete with bridge builders here, we're competing with these other guys, so go fast. Well, they've had how many hundreds or thousands of years head start on us building bridges? Uh, yeah, even the nature of the more, problem is yeah. different. The costs yeah. are huge, right, compared to what we have. Pick up but you also have a lot more pick up a knowledge for about structural, and, you know, the structural materials and things yes. like that. We're still figuring it out. <laughs> I got a question. Uh, in what ways can, uh, can QA uh, kind of promote the quality mindset uh, throughout the team? Uh, I've had some uh, QAs report to me that really had, you know, asked those good questions and all that, but there wasn't as much uptake in the developers that were working with them, and they got kind of frustrated by that. What so, sort of quality were you looking for? Um, just thinking about quality and, and, and asking these questions about, about the quality of the things you're building and, you know... Um, the Is there two few scenarios in one, in one person's mind versus a, the next person's? Maybe. Maybe a little bit like that, yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's in how they ask the questions that I've seen, right? How do you phrase the question? Do you put it in something they understand? Risk or... Are you getting picky at details? Like, just sometimes it's how you ask the question that makes all the difference in the world. I well, I think there can be bigger problems or, that are causing mm -hmm. that. Uh, are the developers rewarded for writing production code, or are they rewarded for delivering a high quality product? Yes. And what I what I've seen work is get the whole team together, including all the different people in all the different roles, and say, what level of quality do you want to produce? We're a self organizing team, hopefully. What level of quality are we committed to? And, you know, well, a team I was on a few years back said, well, we want to write code that we take home and put on our refrigerators and show our moms because we're so proud of it. <laughs> and, uh, well, what does that mean? It has to mean something. So the story I, I told during your session of, I was on a team that was committed to quality and part of that we thought was doing acceptance test driven development or specification by example. and. And then, but we couldn't do it the way we wanted to do it through the API level. We could have just thrown up our hands and said, well, we said we were going to have high quality, but we can't do that, so oh well, too bad. But instead we said, well, okay, all we can do is do it at the UI level. We've said we're going to produce high quality code, let's give this a try. And so it has to mean something at the team level and then keep revisiting at your team retrospective of what's in our way of achieving this goal of high quality. 
But also, management has to support that by actually allowing the team to self-organize and let them manage their workload. If they keep driving them to meet deadlines and they keep saying, well, uh, you know, it's okay to cut corners sometimes, but if they keep saying, well, okay, well, don't do any of that testing stuff because we just need this ready for the expo next week. If they keep doing that, why would the programmers have any self-interest in producing high-quality code and, and being concerned with that? And they're I, not. If they're being driven to deliver lines of code and something that compiles, that's what they'll do. I, I think sometimes it's also how test interfaces with develop, development. If we say we found problems with your code, well, that's not going to, that, that puts everybody on the defensive. Well, sometimes we get a little bit too cozy too, and developers trust their testers too much. So yeah, it's, it's too I don't really have to care because I know my awesome group of testers oh. are going to care yeah. everything. I think it was a little bit like that. Yeah, that's, that's actually also a problem. Yeah. And it seems so nice at first. Of, yes, I like working with these developers. They value my job. This is so much fun. <laughs> you realize that you're actually taking on too much ownership of quality without meaning to that they're giving it up. And they could also create that kind of situation. And then you have to push back a little bit and show that, you know, you can actually do a little bit of a better job of checking your stuff before you hand it to me. Right. And still be nice about it, of course. <laughs> I think that in a lot of development organizations that there's a lack of accountability when they're when the developer produces a defect or a bug. It's just sort of an uh, you know, I was a QA manager for a long time, and it was the buck was passed to us. Like you guys missed this. Well, product management or the product owner didn't specify that, and development didn't build it, and we didn't find it because it wasn't there. But you're saying we missed it. But if you make, if you build in some accountability, and I'm not talking about shaming anyone, but people should understand when a mistake's been made and who made it. And I think if you do that, people are going to be a lot more interested in what their testers are doing and how they're testing and, and how they can produce better quality code. So one of the things I kind of, <clears throat> I'm going to disagree a little bit on that, yeah. um, is one of the things I try to get, I call it, um, if I'm a tester and somebody comes to me and says, how come you missed that bug, which is kind of what you're saying, uh, I go, hmm, if I take that monkey and say, I don't know how I missed that bug. That's now my monkey. What I would much rather see is to say, oh, did we, and take it back to the team, we missed this bug. Let's figure out how we missed it, because it's not one person. Um, and when we start doing the name blank, then we start running around. And so I'd rather take it back to the team and, and bring it up and say, hey, we found this bug. Um, how can we improve our process so it doesn't happen again, right? And, and so I really um, say be careful about taking the monkey because it's really easy. And if we start pointing fingers, then people are going to start doing that whole CYA thing again, and nobody's going to go anywhere. But take it back as a team. How did we miss this? Yeah, if you start pointing fingers, you really take the courage out of all agile. The courage and, and, and the trust. Just, it's yeah. deflates the speed at which you're doing anything. I, I still awful. run into companies where they they re, they evaluate performance of testers based on how many defects they found. I know. And they evaluate performance of programmers based on how many defects they introduced. And I'm, I wonder how the relationship is between those groups. I just think people do so much harm with those kind of metrics and so much harm with those kind of blames. And it, that's why I say take a team ownership. Does the team care about quality? You know what? Everybody does care about quality. The programmers don't want bugs to go out in production. Who wants to do a bad job? Nobody wants to do that. They end up doing a bad job because they're not allowed to manage their own work and they're, and they're forced to cut too many corners. Uh, accountability is by, we're a, a team, we're in this together, and wow, we got some bugs into production. Let's have a retrospective on those and try to figure out uh, some experiments we can try to see if we can cut down on how many bugs, or let's set a goal. No more than this many bugs in the next six months, and if we don't meet that goal, let's sit down and find out some experiments we could try to to maybe get yeah. work towards that goal together, but not, well, Joe here introduced the defect, and yeah. Janet didn't catch it, and this is really bad. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not suggesting hanging, 
sorry. More, it's less about the person and more about the root cause analysis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. And that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. You have to go ask that question. Did QA miss it because they failed to write or run a test they shouldn't run? Did development miss it because they can't type? Yeah, so. Did a typo or did requirements miss it because we failed to do requirements? Is it some right. combination? You have to understand that. Yeah, but you, you ask a different question. You don't say, did somebody miss it? You say, how did this happen? And what can we do to prevent it? And maybe what we need to do is experiment with something like, um, what was it, storming? Event storming or story mapping. Maybe we're just, every, we need the shared understanding. We're not having the shared understanding, obviously, of the requirements of these features. What could we experiment with? There are tons of techniques out there. Uh, seven dimensions of quality. There are just a million techniques out there we could try. Let's experiment with a couple of those next release and see if that does better. But we need to kind of back up. Root cause analysis is great. Sometimes we can't find the root cause. Yeah. Sometimes it's a, a law of diminishing returns looking for it. So let's just experiment and see if we can do better. Whatever the cause was, let's just experiment. I think though that if what we're talking about, if there's a gap there, if there's a defect, yeah. we need to understand where that came from because you know when I was a QA manager I wanted to understand what are the, what can I learn from that what gaps exist that are similar to that what what are we missing that's what is that an indication of that we're missing and where else could we be missing that and I want to find out where else I need to patch and if it was on the development side and I'm not pointing fingers when I'm talking about you know shaming anyone I'm just saying it was Lisa's fault <laughs> what, what did you miss and where else could, might you have missed that? Yeah. Right. And if you're not doing that, and it, I think that some accountability is necessary, and and I don't think it's a matter of you know making okay. someone feel bad about it, but just yeah. can I can I introduce different. a different idea? So team accountability, but personal discipline. It's ultimately at right? the team level. So I agree yeah. with you 100. It is it is about the team's performance. Yeah, but if if we know discipline and we know that we're expected to produce this much this level of quality or whatever, it now becomes a team. It, it becomes an individual because. I know that every test I write is going to be reviewed by this programmer. So we're going to have a team accountability, but I have a personal investment to, because I hate doing bad things that I'm going to try to do the best job I can. So team accountability, personal discipline in, in doing a good job. And, and you know, maybe the bug got introduced because the programmer was working 80 hours a week and he was tired and wasn't allowed to do any good practices. He really wanted to try to do TDD or pair programming, but he wasn't allowed to do that because we don't have time for those things around here. And I just think a lot of these problems are at the management level. And I, I think going after individuals and working at an individual defect level, personally, I think that's the wrong approach. Well, there, is, there is things that will be simple. Like you simple. can't, you, you yeah. can't, you can't uh, go and uh, hang someone for, for a mistake where they previously had no more mistakes than other people, uh, but just because that happened to be on a feature that the CEO thought was really important, right? So the worst place for it to happen. <laughs> anyway, so um, yeah, yeah. This is uh, a classic problem of uh, no, no uh, joint ownership, no, no involvement of people to determine what they're going to be writing, and that's why some some things look like bigger mistakes versus some things that are small mistakes. They all came through the same process, but somehow it was less emphasis on this. That is the majority of the problem. Or, Unless, of course, there is some bad apple, and you yeah, know, it's it just not. Good. It could be, but you know, people tend to jump to that immediately yeah. instead of saying that, "Hey, wait a second, you know, that thing that we thought was a small feature. Well, guess what? The CEO and, and the PO and all these people thought it was incredibly huge. How do we not know about this? Right? It's usually back to we didn't actually act as a team. We acted as four separate departments playing. Chinese telephone. Right? <laughs> yeah, I think if it gets, you know, when a, when a defect gets out or escapes or whatever, everyone needs to take their part of the blame for it or the ownership, and we could have done this better. And what I like seeing is, um, you know, when I've worked with development teams uh, or development manager who's, who's really worrying about what it is from the developer's perspective that could have changed, could, they could have done better on. and. It, you know, they're not pointing their finger, they're asking, okay, how can, and developers and testers, how can I do better so I don't get that again next time? Yeah. That's a much healthier Absolutely. way to approach it for the team. What can I do to make sure that doesn't happen again? Well, sometimes the things that slip through are really serious problems that cause a lot of issues for a lot of people, and sometimes they're fairly minor. 
And especially when you end up having those discussions about the minor ones and you do a lot of root cause analysis, I just have to ask myself, so you really think that's the only bug that slipped out in the production? <laughs> what about all the ones you haven't found? So, well, Lisa said, sometimes you spend a bit too much time on root cause analysis too. Absolutely, you have to still be sane about it and use a risk-driven approach in your t thinking. So if there's, if there's persistent problems with quality, uh, there's other tools you can use that obviously, again, you collaborate. Uh, one that I, that I like to use is value stream analysis. When you have, uh, a, you know, tracking what happens when the customer gives you a defect, how does that travel back through? Who does the triage? How long does it spend there? You really map out on, with, with the right people in the room where those things were. Um, certain people will be able to input some things such as, oh, well, this was in the backlog for this long, or this was here for this long, or this didn't get tagged right, or it didn't get assigned in Jira to someone, and then we cleaned it up at the end of one iteration to actually get it assigned again. And you find these gaps. It's like, oh, wait a second. Well, we're, we're waiting an extra week for God knows what. And we get this accrual of all these um, defects and, or fixes that need to be in. They don't go in and they start to spiral. So you can, value stream analysis is very important too to look at some of these things. Identify waste. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I like a lot of value stream analysis from lean development. A lot of the things that come from there are very useful. And one of the things that I've learned from reading about Lean Startup and hearing about Lean Startup is the idea of the validated learning of get your minimum viable product in production and, and get feedback from your customers. And I, most teams I've been on, we've done a terrible job of doing any kind of measurement or getting any kind of feedback. You know, when once that feature is delivered out the door, we're on the next thing. We don't even care anymore about that thing that's now in production. And so I think it's really important to think about at the beginning, ask your stakeholders, well, how will you know this feature is successful once it gets to production? How will we know? What can we measure? Most of them they can't answer you. But it it's really can help you with the next features down the line to know what was important to the customers. How did they perceive that? Maybe there were a bunch of defects and they just didn't care because the value it was giving them, the abilities it was giving them made up for it. What was the question that started this? <laughs> uh, blaming, uh, blaming one person, right? Um, no, it was it had a oh, problem. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Wow, oh, just, I was just going to say that it kind of went around. So, yeah. But one last thing about lean, who's, who's uh, done any kind of lean practices here? Anyone done anything like that? Okay, well, there's, there's a few other things as you're developing new stuff I, that I found really useful. And it goes back to whether you should automate or not, and whether you should actually write something. Um, adding something in your workflow that uh, that says I have to actually send this email reply and be a cog in the machine that I'm creating gives you that insight as to how the machine's working. So that's one of the things that I saw in a lot of lean practitioners when they're doing their first products is they'll actually say, well, I'm, I'm not going to develop this system. I'm just going to be mechanical Turk for it, um, or my product owner is, and they're going to manually every day do this. Sure, we'll we'll wait an extra day, but they'll feel the pain of actually uh, doing that chore, and they'll see if it's important or not, and they'll see the parts that want to uh, that need to be automated. So I don't know if there's a proper word yeah. for the um, mechanical trick part of the lean stuff. But yeah, I don't know if there is or not. Yeah, it's but it's been it's been it's been neat yeah. to don't don't write the whole solution. Automate as much as you can, and put people in the important parts so you can feel what the system. Oh, um, the other the other part of that is looking at the system as a whole versus trying to uh, fix this little part. Because if this little part isn't the bottleneck, uh, theory of constraints, right? Then you're wasting your time. Because I can get this piece as good as it can possibly be, but the problem's over here, right? That's slowing everybody down. So that's another. So there's no net gain. No net gain. I think it was Johanna Rothman, was it? The was talking about doing an exercise with one of the companies she worked with where she actually got everybody on the team to, to act out what that. was going on with the software so they all got a, <laughs> this ginormous overview of what, what was going on, what the system was cool. doing, how That's it was responding, cool. you know, before be they ever... It sounds like Johanna would do that. Yeah, yeah, I think it was her. Sounds, yeah, it sounds like something she would do. <laughs> 
So uh, I talked a lot about automated testing today, but there are lots of facets of automation that are that are that support automated testing, like automated automated provisioning of your environment, for instance. Yes. Um, how does that fit in with the whole picture? Any comments about Don't that? Don't forget about it. <laughs> if, to my mind, if it's boring, if it's easy to make mistakes, error prone, if it takes a lot of time and you do it over and over and over again, automate it, right? I think those are my top three things. Yes. <laughs> my only caveat to that is don't get sold a solution that you don't need. Automate the problems because there's all this DevOps movement and you have Chef, Puppet, Ansible, uh, you know, you can name a million of them now, but you know what works for me is simple bash scripts. Yes, cool. They you do know, everything. Absolutely. You want a web server? It's Netcat. It's available in any, anything that supports bash. That's it. Simple. <laughs> Sometimes Sim keep it's simple. Simple, simple so you can feel. You can stop adding magic to that stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so start introducing tools once you need them, um, but start simple. Yeah. So it's explicit. Be as explicit about everything that you do, even when you're automating. I think there is, there is a point where we need to, to, to stop it and say, do I really want to automate this now, as opposed to maybe giving a chance to other people to experience this too. Like, because if I don't manage it right away, and then everybody else just use my automated method or click here and it magically happens, then the moment that breaks or something changes behind the scenes, nobody else will know how to do it, or will know, nobody else will know what's really going on for that process. So we're not talking really about testing, but the process itself. Um, so if, as soon as I automated it, I, I, I automated it. It's out of mind. I, I forgot about it now. I just I've automated it. So, um, you still want to keep that knowledge around. So maybe you do want to wait a little bit before you automate absolutely everything. Well, and I think it's just, again, cost versus benefit. It's the same as when I, I'm going to write a document. Do I create a new, or even better, presentations? Should I create a new fancy template that I'm going to use once, or should I just make the presentation, ignore editing the master slide, and just do what I need to do? Do I need to create an Excel macro that does this calculation for me, or it's the truth, I'm probably only going to do it once, it's actually going to be faster to do it manually. So it's the same kind of thinking about cost versus benefit and creating waste that sort of applies to everything. And it's not unique for automation, but it becomes much more visible and the cost can become much bigger. The cost can actually inflate as people try the features that came with the product you bought to solve problem one. <coughs> but all of a sudden you see very small instances of problems two, three, and four and so you start to make use of that really fancy new report. <laughs> you totally draw focus into a different area. Um, well, and I've tried using so many sticky notes applications <laughs> in browsers on my mobile devices, and it doesn't work for me. I waste time. Pen and paper, <laughs> that's a trick every time. So, again, I don't think it's unique to automation. It's something we should always think about. It's just that, like you said, the cost can just expand or inflate so much faster with automation, and they're so much bigger. I remember at some point, that, I don't remember what it was, but maybe somebody here remembers that there was like a, a rule of you know, how often do you do this that determines how much time you should spend automating it. So if you do this, you, know, you spend three hours a week doing this, then maybe you should spend half an hour automating it. If you can't automate it half an hour, then maybe you shouldn't yeah. because it's not that important. Um, I don't remember exactly the oh. source for it, but yeah, I don't remember yeah. reading that at this point. Yeah, there's an ROI calculation. It doesn't just apply to tests, right? You can just figure out how often am I doing this and how long does it take me to do today? How long will it take me to automate? So how many iterations of doing it manually? You can will pay that's on XKCD chart, isn't it? XKCD is a great resource for fun and graphics for presentations. <laughs> yeah, I swear it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Any further questions? Uh, so with our company, we kind of started automation within the last two years or so, and we've seen the number of automated scripts grow exponentially to keep up with the manual tests that are going. So at some point, we're starting to look at you know possible roadblocks we're going to hit in terms of the runtime it takes to generate and to, to print out the you know the results to justify this is passed and no, it's not. 
Do you guys have any tips in advance so the companies that are kind of starting and maintaining what do you, automation? What do you mean about print out the results? Well, just even display them. You're talking about actually running all the tests and then it's going to take like a day to actually get some sort of feedback. So it goes back to integration. So you're looking at that pyramid in my, in my presentation where you want the majority of your um, tests to be unit tests, not integration tests or group tests at the top. So as you grow your um, test, uh, test suite, grow the unit tests. Don't grow the other stuff. That's death. The other, the inverse is, is death. <laughs> yeah, so you can also you will freeze. You can also run tests in parallel, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, don't run them on one machine. You can run them on multiple on grid. Um, and you can select you know, subsets of your tests to run at certain times and not do full runs of your tests until you're ready to release. But, but uh, still, I, I like to go back and, and make sure that a lot of the testing can be done as explicitly as possible, taking away the reliance on slow services and make sure that your logic, the stuff you own, you know, things that you don't own, there's actually a really good uh, slide that uh, J.B. Rainsberger has in that presentation I mentioned and that would be where you uh, push all uh, interaction with things outside your system out to the boundary as far as you can so that everything inside is things that are being uh, tested with proper contracts and both sides of the contracts are tested. That way you get rid of that multiplicative problem of trying to run every single value combination. So that J.B. Rainsberger presentation is a good who's, one to watch. Who's creating this automated test? Well, I guess it's driven from our user stories. No, no, curious. but who, who on the team is writing the code for um, those tests? I guess automation specialists. So are they as good at designing code as the people who are running production code? Do they know how to make the code really maintainable and use all the good refactoring patterns to make that code as efficient as possible well, and maintainable as possible? Um, <laughs> you know, we're always looking into devs for help as well, but that person was hired to kind of do that, so. so that, yeah. I mean, that's why I think, you know, the people who write test code is maybe more important than production code, and I don't understand why we hire a different person to write that code. That's just my personal feeling. Why do we hire somebody different? The programming skills are the same. So why do we hire somebody different? The testers can always specify the test cases. But it's my experience that when you hire automation engineers, I was an automation engineer once. I wasn't as good at writing code as the people writing production code. And I did an okay job, but we spent a lot of time making those tests. If the people writing production code had written them, we wouldn't have had that issue. And and that was a real aha moment for me, and it was hard to accept because I liked doing the automation, but I wasn't as good, I was never going to be as good at it as the people whose job was a programmer. How much of your automation is um, uh, regressions for bugs? Is it all just specs? Actually, we use it for regression. That's the biggest problem, because you are driving bad design to the, to the OS. The regressions for your bugs should be at the unit test level. If you can, but yeah. uh, they usually can. Yeah. <laughs> It'll drive a better design. Um, say push the test slower. It, basically, you you want in agile, you want the fastest feedback, and it's got a it's got a very good instead of a death spiral, it's got a, a jump out of into into uh, into greater things if you start uh, pushing things because things like TDD will drive better design. And you can even unit test the UI, JavaScript, unit testing. Yep. JavaScript, my team does TDD on all the JavaScript. And so yes, most of, most of the bugs, they can isolate here. Sometimes they do not take, I don't know. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah. that's not, definitely that multiple bit of effect of, uh, now you gotta manage a whole bunch of stuff and you're basically frozen in the code base. I mean, you might as well just call it legacy code and say this is a black box and make another system. Eventually, if you're getting to the point where you don't know if the tests are not are going to be finished by tomorrow morning. You're you're pretty much stuck in mud. Every day, every day, every day, every day. Yeah, listen, definitely listen to that talk that Adam mentioned. Uh, integration tests are a scam. Uh, it was useful for like um, having changing our views on it at our company, and it was a good way of talking both to devs and QAs about it uh, to change our approach. What was the name of it again? JB Rainsberger. Integration, integration tests. tests are a scam. You can just look at 
look at that up on uh, YouTube. And There's a very good presentation good, yeah. that he does live. That's quite good. And JB says, look at the latest one. Yeah, I think he did. Uh, he, there was an earlier one that was a presentation. I think yeah. 2012, and last year he did a live one. So if you search YouTube, you should be able to find his live one. That's the more uh, up to date. But yeah, quite good. Okay. Any final questions, or I think we're good. Okay, thank you guys very much for sticking around and sharing.